And thank goodness, after all that, we made it back home. Hello everyone, my name is Pixorifs and welcome back to the Minecraft Survival Guide. I hope you enjoyed the last episode. I am just now returning from recording that episode and heading back home. So I've made it straight back here pretty easily. After all, we just had to head south because we did a lot of traveling north. As soon as I found the swamp, I knew where I was. And then these little kind of floating outcroppings of the mountain biome here are fantastic for navigating because you see them floating floating in the sky, a hundred blocks above where the ground is, and you're like, okay, yeah, I think I know where I am now. So I'm going to be keeping those there as a navigational feature for a good long while. I did want to highlight one other thing that we could have done to actually expand the area where we could be visible on the map, and I will do that with the uh, original map that we made rather than the buried treasure map. I just need to make sure I know which one that is. And if you put a map in a crafting table and surround it with even more paper, it will actually zoom the map out. And you'll notice that the scale changes like so. So if we look at that now, we are, <laughs> it's actually gonna show the Southern part of the map because of where we are in the world, but it will actually expand the area shown on this map outwards. And you can see that when we travel a little bit further, the area that's visible expands slower because it's at a smaller scale. We are right there in the in the top right hand corner of the map, and that's where we're going to uh, where we're going to sit on this map now. It is also possible to put these maps inside of item frames, so you can uh, you can have these up on a wall somewhere and have a map of your world on the wall, or even on a table if you want to, because item frames can be placed on the floor as of this update as well. But I don't know about you guys, I am pooped. I've done so much exploring. I think I just need to go to sleep right about now. So. <laughs> Let me skip through the night. Let's make it daytime and then let's see if we can put some of our newfound treasures away in the right places. Here we go. Let's put the gold in here. Let's put the iron in here. Fantastic. We've got so much iron now. That's just great. We have nine diamonds and we've even got our first emeralds. That's great stuff. So we can put those in there. I'm also going to put the heart of the sea in here because... Right now, this is sort of useless. Without gathering Nautilus shells, which you can get by fighting drowned zombies or occasionally through fishing, it's going to be quite useless. We're not going to be able to transform it into a conduit, and it doesn't do anything aside from that. So, you know what? Let's leave that in there for the moment. Let's put the iron nuggets away in here as well. And the rest of this stuff is all sort of materials and crops and that kind of thing. So by now we know where to put these. We can put this in there. We can put the crops in one of these chests or maybe even go out and expand our crop farm now that we have potatoes. Might turn the wheat into hay bales and stash them in the loft of the barn. You get the idea. So I've been doing a little bit of tree farming here. I've been doing a little bit of leaf gathering as well. Just been shearing some leaves. We're still getting tons of saplings out of the trees over here. So don't need to worry about that too much and I've been using the leaves to do the same thing we did with the house and kind of make the barn feel like it's a little bit more part of the landscape. Just adding a few bushes around the entrance and stuff like that really helps it nestle in. So I wanted to talk a little bit more about the map, seeing as we've been using those quite heavily in the last couple of episodes. As you can see, the area in the top right-hand corner of the map right now is the area that's exposed, because that's the area we've explored. And it's important to note that maps will not fill out unless you've got them in your hands. So if we go exploring all the way over here, let's just uh, hop our way up this hill and towards the other biomes that we saw in the distance over there, the map will not do anything while it is out of my hands. And then when we take the map out, now it's exposed, but it doesn't do that in the background. Like if you're not holding the map in front of you to expand this area out, it won't fill that area in unless you uh, <laughs> unless you're actually holding the map, unless you take the map out at that point. So if I now run over there, maybe two or 300 blocks, it's not going to fill in this bottom corner of the map at all. It's only going to do that if I'm holding the map or if I take the map out once I'm standing in that area. Let's head over here across the river into this spruce forest to give you an example. And wow, this is quite an interesting natural basin with some slightly derpy uh, <laughs> terrain generation up there, but not to worry, that's par for the course with Minecraft. You will find a lot of stuff that looks a little bit unnatural as you explore the world, but that is part of the charm of Minecraft to a lot of people, myself included. That is definitely part of the fun. All right, I think I've, I've explored a fair distance right now. I should have explored most of the bottom part of that map. Let's open it up and see where we're at. As you can see, the area in between where we are now in the bottom left-hand corner 
and the plains biome there has not been explored on the map, despite the fact that we've clearly just walked through it. So now, if I walk back in that direction, you will start to see the area fill out. If I try and retrace my steps without falling down this cliff, that would be a good idea, wouldn't it? Then, uh, yeah, you'll find that that area starts to fill out and we get a better picture of our surroundings, but only when the map is held in our hands. Okay, folks, it is night time. There are terrors out there, and I... I'm going to try and fight this Enderman. The reason being, we need Ender Pearls for some point in the not too distant future where we might be going to find a stronghold. Now, the best way to get the jump on an Enderman is to go up and attack it without looking at it first so that it can uh, you can get a little bit of damage before it gets angry and starts attacking you. But be warned, Endermen really pack a punch. So this is the point at which you will want to have a shield on you and preferably some really good armor with some decent protective enchantments as well. I'm going to put my shield up, wait for him to attack me, and then do a quick swipe. This is probably the best way of attacking Endermen when they're out in the open like this. You need to alternate blocking and attacking. Make sure you attack after it's hit you once. And that was unfortunately unsuccessful. We did not get it to drop an Ender Pearl, so <laughs> we'll have to save that for another time. But when we encounter another Enderman, I will show you a much more effective way of attacking Enderman, one that will hopefully mean that you don't have to worry too much about taking any damage or blocking with a shield at all. As I've explored a little bit more of this map, I've noticed these two red dots down here in the left-hand side, which I'm heading towards at the moment, and at first I thought maybe those are some surface lava lakes that we can use to gather a large quantity of obsidian. But it turns out that they're actually part of a ravine. <laughs> they are two lava sources that open out from the walls of this ravine into the bottom there, and I don't really want those to be on the map right now because I sort of, I, I, I want to make sure that I know where all of the lava lakes are in this area. So by pouring water on them from above, I might actually be able to drown the, uh, the lava source in the wall there and prevent it from flowing out. And as you will see, if this is successful, yep, we, we seem to have stemmed the flow of lava there. Once I walk away from that on the map now, you can see that the dot is no longer red. In fact, it's turned blue because there is now water down there. Maps will actually update as you go. As you build stuff and as you make changes to the environment, the map will update if you've got it in your hand. Again, it's one of those things where if you're not holding the map and you make an update and then you go away again, the map won't necessarily reflect that update until you come back into that surrounding area holding the map. But we can get rid of these two red dots so we're not misled into believing that there are lava lakes down here. I'm actually on the lookout for lava lakes though because they are a great source of obsidian. If you find one in the overworld, it means you don't have to worry too much about digging down into caves. You can end up finding a lava lake on the surface. Just cast a bucket of water over the top of it, use your diamond pickaxe to gather all the obsidian, and then you've got a nice, easy source of obsidian for nether portals without having to worry about going down into the depths of the caves and fighting too many monsters. But there we go, the lava sources down there are all taken care of, and as you can see, there are no more red dots left on the map. But now this map has been fully explored, I want to display it somewhere, and I think this nice area area of blank white wool over the top of the staircase here will be a perfect place for it. So how about if this is going to be sort of the bottom left hand corner of the territory, let's put it there like so. And as you can see, it displays in full on the wall once we've explored the whole area of this map. And if we wanted to, we could zoom this out even further to show a wider picture of our surroundings. But once again, it would take a lot more time to explore. So I think we will leave it at this scale for now with our farmhouse and barn clearly visible there. And maybe we'll expand further into this territory, or maybe I'll go a few blocks north of here and fill out the next area of the map. Either way, I'm going to put some item frames on the wall around here just to <laughs> mark this area out as a place I want to build a kind of map of the surrounding area. I can't exactly call it a world map because the world itself is huge, but uh, it's certainly a map of our little world as we have it right here. We might even be able to fit our buried treasure map on it somewhere, although something tells me that it does not quite line up with the territory we have here. You can see that river kind of ends abruptly and some of these things don't line up. So that is obviously a little bit further up here, maybe even as far up as that. I don't know, we'll have to see, but it seems to be working with the same scale that our map down here is. So sooner or later, we might be able to connect these up. 
Now I'm heading back down to one of the deeper parts of our cave system in the hopes of finding the lava that I was previously hoping to find on the surface. It looks like there are a few zombies down here, but no worries, let's deal with those and oh, there seems to be some lapis lazuli here that I didn't collect the first time I was here. Well, that was, <laughs> that was lucky because now I have a fortune pickaxe, we should be able to get a little bit more lapis. But that's not why we're here, we're here for some of this stuff, we're here for the obsidian, because in today's video I'm going to show you how to connect great distances very, very easily through the nether. That's right, folks. Today we are going to start on our nether hub. And unfortunately, a lot of this involves obsidian mining, which is fairly boring right now, but I'm going to do most of this off camera. Just wanted to show you guys that we are harvesting this legit. <laughs> We're down here with a bucket of water and an efficiency for pickaxe will help this process go a little bit faster. So it's not the worst thing in the world once you've got a little bit of efficiency, but I'm going to mine maybe 26, 28 obsidian, something like that. So we have enough to make a couple of decent sized nether portals because today's lesson is quite an important one for the structure of your world. It's a good way of getting back and forth and it's going to be very, very useful as a skill to have in your Minecraft skill set. We now have 29 obsidian, which is a decent amount. That's enough to make at least two nether portals, and that will be crucial for what we want to do today. A nether hub is not too complicated to make. It involves doing a little bit of maths, but it's a very efficient way of being able to travel long distances in the shortest amount of time. If you don't want to do all of your exploring via the overworld, if you just want to get somewhere very quickly, then it's a good place to start. I'm going to head back out north of our settlement here. The settlement is over there. We're still heading north in this direction, and we're going to head back towards the ocean biome that we found on the other side of the swamp in the last episode. So we'll go through the swamp to the other side, and there we're going to set up a nether portal. It's a decent distance away from our base, which means we shouldn't have too much trouble with nether portal mechanics, but also it's access to a biome that is a little bit further away. And this should hopefully allow us to set up a nice, easy connection to the ocean so that we can come here quickly anytime we want. How about we use this little outcropping of land over here to set up our nether portal? That seems like a a good place as any to do things. Let's break this boat so that we don't tend to <laughs> glitch out standing on it. There we go. Okay, so right here seems like a good place for the nether portal. I think we can set one down here. We're going to establish our portal frame right here and then light it up like so with the flint and steel. And then we're going to press F3 so that we have the coordinates of this thing. And I'm going to press F2 to take a screenshot of exactly where this portal is. And normally when you step through a nether portal to the nether on the other side, it will create a brand new portal. So let's see if it's done that this time around. Nope, it's done what I expected it to. It's actually brought us out at the portal for our farm settlement. So as you can see, nether portals behave slightly strangely. And today, part of today's tutorial, I guess, is going to be showing you exactly how to link up nether portals so that they appear exactly where you want them to appear. Also, there is now a cow in the nether. <laughs> And when we step out of the nether, we're back at the farmhouse. So you can see that we've traveled a long distance from the swamp already, but that would only be a one-way trip. Because this nether portal is linked up to the one in the nether where we came out the first time around, going through any other nether portal and coming back here is sort of inconvenient. That's not something we want to happen. And that is why I took the coordinates that appear in this screenshot. So I've opened up the screenshot in a photo viewer. I can put it on the screen for you and you'll see that the X, Y, Z coordinates are minus 10, 66, minus 242. Now in our episode about the nether, you might have heard me say that one block in the nether counts for eight blocks in the overworld. And what that means is we can divide the coordinates of our nether portal in the overworld by eight and we'll get the coordinates where that portal should appear in the nether if we want it to link up nice and easily. So I'm going to head back into the nether and the coordinates we are looking for are minus 1.5, 66 and minus 30. And the reason for that is 240 divided by 8 is 30 and 10 divided by 8 is something around one and a half. It's a, it's a very small number. It's almost insignificant by comparison. But if we go to about minus 30, that's about here. And here, around there, is where we start getting into the minus numbers. So it looks like around here is the place we need to establish our other nether portal. Now, it's going to be a little bit awkward with the terrain right here, so I might just make this nether portal kind of a bridge if we come out like so. It's difficult to build on soul sand, so I should probably step this way a little bit. There we go, we'll put that there. 
and we'll look out for the ghasts that I just heard, but hopefully we shouldn't get fireballed in the process of this. Let's make this one three long, like so. We'll go up one, two, three, four. We're not saving any of the obsidian this time around. We're making the portal frame however I want to. And if we hop into this portal now, hopefully, if I've done the maths right, that should bring us out at the swamp. And there we go, we're back to our boat, we're back at the swamp, and this portal should now be pretty well linked up. Now, you'll notice that the Y coordinate was roughly the same, because there you don't have to divide that one by eight. The up and down <laughs> coordinate is not something you need to worry too much about when creating nether portals. However, don't make one that's really high up in the ceiling unless you know what you're doing, because oftentimes that will spawn in the sky, in the nether, or in the overworld, and that's, yeah, that's not, not the ideal set of circumstances. So shoot for somewhere around the roughly the same Y position, and if you, uh, if you divide the other coordinates by eight, you should find where you need to go. And now this is actually very, very close. If you, if you look at how far we came through the swamp to get here, we're, we're, we're talking like hundreds of blocks in that direction. But now all I need to do is hop back through into the nether, avoid falling into any of these ravines, and walk literally the 30 blocks it takes to get back to this portal, and we're back at the farmhouse. And that was a very, very quick trip, and one that, while it does go through the nether, was not particularly dangerous, because there weren't a lot of hostile mobs around trying to kill us. So if you want to travel long distances in the overworld, this is one of the better ways to do it. It saves a lot of time traveling through the nether. Short distances like that can be covered in a matter of seconds. Longer distances, especially if you want to go thousands and thousands of blocks out, can be covered within about a minute sometimes. So it's, it's really not that difficult to set these things up. The most important thing at this stage is to make sure it's safe, because there are still going to be dangers in the nether, there are going to be ghasts, there are going to be lava pits and ravines and things you can fall into. So in order to set up a successful nether hub, and something you will see a lot of people doing in their own world, is creating tunnels between the two. Now one of the things to take into account when you're building anything in the nether is its blast resistance and its resistance to fire. Because ghast fireballs are probably the most destructive thing you will encounter here in the nether, aside from maybe fire, which will spread to nearby wooden blocks and other flammable substances very, very easily. I'm going to place a couple of wood blocks around here to give you a quick example, and you'll probably find those setting on fire quite quickly. The fire will spread to them, you'll notice one face of the block starts to appear like it's on fire, and then the entire block will disappear, meaning that it's been wasted. There you go, we just saw one of those wood blocks disappear, we don't get that back. <laughs> so, unfortunately, yeah, it is difficult to build with wood in the nether and to make sure that it is preserved. Obviously, if you've extinguished some of the fire nearby, you can always build with wood if you are cautious about it. But remember, there are blazes, there are lava pockets and, and lava falls here and there, and there are also ghasts that might end up shooting a fireball at you if they can see you. So one of the important things to remember is that building with wood is not necessarily advisable. Instead, you want to build with less flammable and more blast resistant substances like stone. You can see that ghast is trying to take pot shots at us through the little cubby window over there. Let's see if we can get him with a bow. I don't think we will be able to, but if we dodge around a little bit to the side, we at least want to eliminate the threat of him shooting at us. Oh, there's another one over there. Wonderful. <laughs> well, managed to get him over the top of the fireball. No harm done. Let's see if that other one decides to hang around. Yep, he's up there. Let's see if we can shoot the fireball back at him or just get a decent shot from above. Nice, very clean. <laughs> Nothing too much to worry about. A couple of blocks are broken, but once again, no harm done. Let's run over here and see if we can get the ghast tier. See if he dropped one of those. He's definitely dropped some gunpowder, but it looks like no ghast tier for us today. Sad times. No worries though, <laughs> let's get back to building our nether hub. So the first thing I probably want to do is make sure this area over here is safe because this portal opens out onto quite a large drop if you're facing the wrong way and you leave in a hurry. So I do want to make sure that this has a nice platform around it. And much like the cobblestone box we built over there, protecting the portal itself from ghast fireballs is of quite 
large importance because <laughs> if we end up uh, if we end up getting fireballed by this and we don't have a flint and steel on us then the portal could deactivate and then we won't be able to use it to get our way home luckily we have another portal in the nether and it would just be a matter of coming through this portal from the other side to relight it although that might always create another portal but we can always go back into the overworld and get our flint and steel once we have a couple of portals established like this. It's not too much of a problem. What is a problem right now is these guys turning up everywhere and threatening to ruin my day. There we go. <laughs> we got him. Again, let's go and see if we got a ghast tier out of that one because ghast tiers are quite a precious resource at this point in time. Nope, once again, it looks like we just got experience and no ghast tier. Never mind. We'll get one eventually. But once you've got a platform here where you can step out and not worry about immediately falling down a drop or into lava, the next thing you probably want to do is create the shortest possible path between these two portals. You know, you can always make this a little bit prettier. We can we can do some designing here. We can put in some, some stone brick and I've brought some polished andesite as well because that is similarly blast proof. Stone and kind of heavier materials like that are a lot better for building tunnels through the nether because for the most part they will not be destroyed by ghast fireballs. While obviously it is possible to build one of these bridges using netherrack and that seems like a perfectly reasonable thing to do considering netherrack is absolutely everywhere here in the nether, it really doesn't have great blast resistance. It's very soft like I said before, it will break very easily and if a ghast fireballs you while you're building this bridge then chances are some of that's going to break and you might end up falling. If, it, if you end up falling to your death either in lava or just from a high enough drop then that's going to be very inconvenient. So you want to build it out of a blast resistant material like stone. Cobblestone works too. We used we used cobblestone in the uh, the portal frame, the little box that we created over there as well. And yeah, just going back to the overworld, bringing in some polished andesite, some stone brick, that kind of stuff, that will work out very well for you. And the ghasts are not leaving me alone today, are they? <laughs> They're certainly trying to take some pot shots. There we go. Get out of here, you. But at least that kind of illustrates my point. If we're going to be building a bridge out here, it needs to be sturdy and protected. Now, I'm actually going to change this up a little bit because I realized I was building a pattern that was three blocks wide, and this is a four block wide nether portal. <laughs> so maybe we should uh, maybe we should avoid doing stuff like that. Maybe we should widen this out a little bit like so, just for our own peace of mind, if nothing else. Let's put two polished andesite in there. There we go. Okay, that feels, that feels a little bit better. <laughs> of course, while we're working in the nether and making a nether hub out of stone, it's probably a good opportunity to gather another bucket of lava <laughs> because that will help us smelt a large amount of stone we'll get a hundred blocks of stone for a single bucket of lava if we play our cards right so I need some lava the problem <laughs> the problem with this section here is that it's a little bit a little bit overflowy and we're not exactly going to be able to grab lava from one of the flowing sections we need to go to the source so I'm gonna take a rather perilous journey here going to might actually use some of the cobblestone to pill it up right now I was grabbing that out of the chest thinking I can use that to uh, to build this but if I want to build it out of this pattern of stone brick and polished and a site that we've got going on i definitely need to get a little bit more smooth stone so probably smelting cobble into smooth stone is going to be my best bet now this is going to be a tricky operation and this is something that i want to make sure there are no ghasts around me for so you can go for a start thank you very much and now we need to get up as high as we can as close as we can to the source of this lava which looks like it's kind of all the way up into the nether ceiling gonna have to scout this very very carefully and remember if we get hit into the lava there's going to be every opportunity that we will be set on fire now i do want to make sure i've got as much protection as possible so you know what i think i might go back and grab myself a potion of fire resistance just in case the worst should happen here so let's very very quickly <laughs> and very carefully make our ascent here i'm just going to hold shift so i don't fall off this thing jump and pillar upwards like so and it looks like this right here is the lava source in the wall. So let me take out this bucket, let me grab that, and that should now dissipate. Lava in the nether moves quicker than it does in the overworld, so hopefully, all things considered, this should clear out this lava fall that's over here very, very quickly. But uh, yeah, it would be nice to uh, to not have a giant wall of lava in my face every time I walk into the nether. Oh, we just lost that piece of cobblestone. That is now gone forever. <laughs> I am still slightly quicker than the lava though, so I'm gonna head down here and see what this looks like from below. It might look a little bit laggy at first, but let's see this whole lava fall clear up. Hey, do you mind? <laughs> Excuse me. You're kind of in the way. I'm trying to watch a spectacle. <laughs> I'm not going to punch you. <laughs> we all know what happens when that happens. But 
Seriously, why are the pigmen getting in the way? <laughs> this is so funny. All right, looks like the lava is now clearing up. Do we have another lava source up there? Nope, that's just taking a little while to clear. Fantastic stuff. And you'll notice that in the background, this is something I spotted off camera, that this will reveal a section down here where if you look closely, oh, maybe it's a little bit more visible from around the corner here. Yes, there it is. There's a giant pillar of a nether fortress there, which would have been useful when I tried to find it in previous episodes. But not to worry, with that cleared out of the way, it's also a nice clean path down to that lava lake down there in case we need to scoop up any more lava to use in our smeltery. Wonderful stuff. Goodbye, lava. <laughs> Good riddance as well. So with a bucket of lava in hand, we've got a lot of stone <laughs> cooking up in these furnaces. So I'm slowly but surely making a little bit more stone brick to add to that road. Not to mention the fact that we've got a decent amount of polished andesite, but considering we're using it every other block, we are starting to run out. However, diorite and cobble can be used to make more andesite. If you even go into a two by two, it doesn't have to be a, uh, a crafting table interface, and combine the two of them, you get one diorite, one cobble together, it makes two andesites. So you can effectively double the amount of andesite you've got. You can even make granite and diorite from cobble and quartz, and then diorite and quartz for granite. But Personally, I'm much more of a fan of andesite than I am of either of the other two blocks, so I'm absolutely fine converting all the diorite I own into andesite and then polishing it in the 2x2 two two kind of crafting interface there, ending up with like more than a stack at this point of polished andesite. I think that will be fine. I think we should be able to use that in the nether hub so far. One problem here is that when you go into the nether for any length of time, it unloads anything that you had loaded in the overworld. So these furnaces and stuff will not keep going while you're in the nether. <laughs> so it may even be worth moving the furnaces into the nether to continue the smelting operation, especially considering we are mostly working around the nether, or you can just keep running back and forth to the overworld and hanging out by the furnaces while they smelt the materials. But for the most part, I think it might be better to actually smelt stuff in the nether itself. The fuel is right close by after all, so <laughs> why not? And now with a little bit of work, we have a path running all the way from one portal to the other. And the path is not fully complete yet. It's also not fully enclosed. And I'm gonna let you in on a little secret right now. It is actually possible to include some more, let's say fragile materials in a nether hub. It is entirely possible for you to construct a tunnel out of glass. And as long as the ghasts don't fire at you whilst you're constructing it, once you are completely enclosed, they won't be able to attack you. The ghasts themselves actually can't spot you through a block, regardless of what the block is. Even if it's transparent block that you can see out of, zombies, ghasts, pigmen, whatever they happen to be, won't be able to actually see you and target you if you are behind a solid block. So including glass in the nether hub is you know, uh, practically not the best thing to do if you're building it for the first time and if you're worried about getting attacked by ghasts, but generally speaking, it is still possible to do that. You can make a nether hub look really pretty. You can even use wood in the construction of it if you're not too worried about, you know, fire spreading from nearby or if you have a uh, fire tick turned off in your world so that you're able to build stuff next to fire with wood and not have to worry about it burning. So, this is the foundation of what is going to be a kind of transport network throughout our Minecraft world. And this is kind of the first step in making the world a lot more accessible to us as a player, making sure that we don't have to travel for hours at a time in order to access further and further resources. But with this firmly under construction, I think that's probably a good opportunity to end the episode. So I want to thank you guys so much for watching the Minecraft Survival Guide. My name has been Pixel Riffs. Don't forget to leave a like on this episode if you enjoyed it. Subscribe to my channel if you want to see more, and I'll see you guys soon. Take care. Bye for now.